every song, but I mean it. I've just got a lot of favorites in the, in the hymnal. I really do. Now, let me solve the mystery. The fella in the purple shirt is not a transient. He's not trying to get bus fare to Detroit. Doesn't need a meal, although I am, and we'll take my tea if that's okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> all the water you can drink. Now, this is a friend of mine, Dwight Porter. We've actually been friends for 40 years, but we don't see each other too much. Dwight is going to lead the singing for us next Sunday. He wanted to come and hear me preach tonight to make sure if he wants to come back next Sunday. If he doesn't show up, you'll know why. <laughs> but uh, Dwight has uh, been around West Tennessee quite a bit. A uh, retired uh, school teacher and librarian in Lexington. Uh, but he, uh, I got to know him when he was at First Baptist Church, Adamsville. Do y'all know that church? Uh, great, great church. And uh, I, I led a retreat for him uh, one week and spoke to their men's brotherhood a couple of times. You union graduates, his father-in-law was Dr. Jim Edmondson, who was the chairman of the history department. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Edmondson was a who? Uh, he, was, he was a professor. He was a full bird colonel in the reserves. He was the head of the Miss Tennessee pageant. And he was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Nutbush, Tennessee. So that's where y'all know him from. Uh, he had four briefcases, and he would just pick up whatever job he was going to. Uh, one, one day he showed up, he picked up the wrong briefcase. And he brought his uh, Miss Tennessee pageant notes and, <laughs> instead of his notes about the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but we're looking forward to having Dwight next Sunday, and you just get to know him. He's a great guy, got a real good personality. Uh, I want you to join me in praying for this situation in Afghanistan. You know, I was thinking this afternoon, imagine how those families of the lost soldiers must feel. You know, 7,000 lives seemingly all for naught. Now, I know they're not all for naught. I know they did a lot of good work, but a trillion dollars in 7,000 lives. And now we're worse off than than we were 20 years ago. They've gone in, they've opened all the prisons, thousands of Al-Qaeda members are now streaming into the streets, and I guarantee you Russia and China are watching. I guarantee you Putin is watching round the clock coverage right now, and they're going to go in, they're going to take advantage of the situation. Who would have thought that there would become a country even worse than Iran in the middle of the uh, Middle East? Afghanistan is going to make Iran look like the sweetest group of Sunday school students you have ever known. So please, please pray. Uh, who knows if these people will even get out? You've got people trapped. The airport is shut down. The embassy has fallen. The president is tucked tail and run. It is a terrible, terrible situation. And we need to be praying for those people, uh, Christians, as I understand it from a friend of mine, uh, Christian house churches were invaded this morning. Uh, numerous beheadings took place. Uh, the heads were impaled on stakes around the city. Uh, it was, it's, it's a horrible situation. And, uh, you know, there's enough time later on down the line to point the finger of blame. You know, right now we just need to get them out of there and just try to, you know, count our losses and get out of there. And, you know, let whatever happens, happens. So you pray for those folks. Uh, keep in mind the announcements that we mentioned this morning. Uh, keep in mind the, uh, the family of uh, Chastity Hendricks, uh, Miss Debbie Smith, who's right around the corner, is her mother. So, uh, graveside will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So you pray for that family. They're really, really sweet. I had an opportunity to go by and visit with them. And Chastity's kids and niece had been at church here not long ago. I, when I opened the door, I recognized the face. And, uh, so they're interested in church and want to get on back. And Miss Debbie does too. This is a great opportunity for us to reach out to them. Uh, Miss Pate, I believe her funeral is uh, Wednesday. <clears throat> Jeanette Pate. I think so, it uh, So you be praying for her. Glad to see Mr. Foy and Miss Peggy here. They're looking great. Uh, I think most of our folks are. Our own men, Steve's been, uh, May's been uh, out of commission for a few days, but he's uh, doing better. We're looking forward to having him back. Uh, Jeff and Alyssa Wells have been sick, but uh, they are uh, on the men, just tired, and 
uh, we want to continue to pray for them. Uh, Tommy Goforth, who, who's Jonathan's dad, really, really needs a kidney transplant. And they're testing everybody they know and still have not found a donor. Apparently he has an unusual blood type, and that's why they've had a hard time finding a donor. But you pray for him, has 5% kidney function. You know, that's about as uh, bad as it can get. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, Charlene Smith has been on the prayer list for a good long while. That's Miss Debbie's daughter. Uh, and, and she's doing real well, according to Madison, her daughter. So we're grateful for that. Right now, uh, she's in remission. But we want to continue to pray for her and that entire family. Do y'all have any concerns you'd like to share? Caleb Glidewell. Caleb Glidewell. Has a COVID pneumonia. It's okay. over then. He's about 25, 26 years old. Caleb Glidewell. Glidewell. G-I-L-E. Glidewell. Glidewell. Okay. Uh, over <coughs> then, 25 years old. That's terrible. Okay, answer prayers. Anybody have that? Uh, yeah, Bob. Uh, my sister was in the rehab. She got out of the hospital a couple weeks ago, went to rehab, and she fell the other day and messed up her arm pretty bad. And then uh, she had to go back into the hospital, and her blood count is real low. Uh, no, she's taken two units of blood already. And uh, they know she's bleeding somewhere or another, but they can't find where it is. They're going to go in in the morning and do an upper GI to see if they can locate the problem. Is that the, that's the one from Collierville? Sorry. Is that the one from Collierville? No, no, no. This is my sister this is, that lives in the uh, sister living place down in Memphis. Oh, okay. She was from Tupelo, and uh, uh, she's having a lot of memory loss. Can't, can't figure out who she is, what she's doing, one of them. And three or four weeks ago, you know, she was doing all her business. Yeah. Something's happening. They don't think it's in the medication they put her on because they hadn't put her on that much different. Something going on. Thank you, Bobby. Any other answer prayers? Carolyn, did Roy get back okay? Maybe he had a little ball cup. Good. Walked by there a while ago. I didn't see his mic yet. I, I prayed for him as he drove the last two or three miles. Right. <laughs> yeah, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for a little bit of a break in the weather, not quite as terribly hot. We do especially pray for that situation in Afghanistan, especially for uh, Americans who are stranded there and just desperately trying to get out. Uh, I pray that you would uh, just part the waters like you did in the Old Testament and allow these folks to get out of there and return home safely to their families and the, se the security of this country. We pray for Christian believers in Afghanistan. Father, that's one of the positives of us being there, that we've gone in and helped establish a little bit of freedom of, of worship, and we know that Christians are, are terrified, and we know, Lord, there's going to be uh, an enforcement of, of cruel Stone Age rules and regulations. I know women there are terrified, and we know that many of them will be executed for the least little offenses. And I pray that peace somehow, some way would, would reign there. And we know the only hope is that Jesus Christ, the, the Prince of Peace. And I pray that he would re reveal himself there. And that people would come together, Father, and set aside thousands of years old hostilities. And they would rally around the fact that there is a God who loves them and has a wonderful, a wonderful plan for every human life. We thank you for the beautiful music that we enjoy through Laura. Thank you for raising her up for such a time as this. And we pray for Dwight as he prepares to lead us next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to continue singing Heaven Came Down.
when he was in Adamsville, he brought a youth choir over here, and they sang uh, when George Scott was the music director. I guess that was after he won his Academy Award play of Patton in the movie. He came back and led our singing. I don't know what year that would have been, but he came over and did that, and uh, that he uh, they came to the Church of Memphis that I serve. So he's a real good uh, choir director, and just looking forward to next Sunday. We're looking together at the Ten Commandments. I hear so many people say, oh, that's Old Testament. That does not apply. That's not relevant. Now, it is true that there are parts of the Old Testament law that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ, and they are not binding on us right now. Anybody here had catfish to eat this year? Anybody in the world had catfish recently? Yeah. Oh, terrible sinners. You have violated the Old Testament law. Any of you had bacon lately? Even though it's now $10 a pound? Oh, you terrible sinners. Oh, you violated the Old Testament law. So there are parts of it that obviously are not uh, to be followed uh, to the nth degree. But these Ten Commandments are relevant and applicable not only then, not only now, but for all time. And tonight we're on commandment number eight. Last Sunday night was thou shalt not commit adultery. Tonight is thou shalt not steal. Let's say it together. Thou shalt not steal. Heavenly Father, I pray that these words would just come alive. Uh, there's probably lots of people sitting here thinking, oh, I'm glad I don't steal. I'm glad this doesn't relate to me. But Father, every word in Scripture is inspired by you. It is relevant. It's applicable. And Father, there are times when all of us steal, maybe not physically, but we steal from you. We steal people's reputations. We steal emotionally. And I pray that we'd acknowledge that and accept your forgiveness and your power uh, for victory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. When Donna and I started at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, we went in with unreasonable expectations. You know, 5,000 men and women preparing for the ministry. Now, we just assumed it would be glorious. It'd be revival every single day. That we'd go into class and people would just be walking the aisles all the time and every class would turn into a glory spell and we'd be singing and just dancing down the hallways and everybody would be nice and everybody would act like Jesus and you'd never have to lock your cars. You'd never have to lock your doors. We just had unreasonable expectations. Well, we got there and found, you know, people are people. <laughs> Whether they're at a seminary or the nicest penitentiary in the state of Texas, people are people. And Satan is Satan. And he wields a lot of influence over people. And we weren't there very long when we uh, discovered this is a grind. <laughs> this is not a whole lot of fun. College was fun. You know, it, it was a laugh a minute. But seminary was grueling. It was not easy. And I hate to tell you, not everybody was nice. Not everybody acted like a preacher. I wonder whatever happened to some of those people because they just didn't have the personality to become uh, a man or a woman of God. Give me an example. I was in a Greek class one time taught by Dr. Curtis Vaughn, a West Tennessee native, a Union University graduate, probably the greatest Greek scholar Southern Baptists have ever produced. And, and we were in Greek class, and Dr. Vaughn came in. He had a great personality, just a dazzling smile. And he came in, and he said, uh, Folks, let me tell you about a letter I got yesterday. It was a letter from one of his former students. And the, the student was now a missionary uh, with a tremendous ministry in Africa. He had led hundreds of people to faith in Christ, he had started dozens of churches, he had translated all of these languages. But the letter, in essence, said, Dear Dr. Vaughn, uh, I have felt badly about this for a long time. And I want to confess to you that I cheated on my final exam 
in your class. I looked over, I stole the answers from my neighbor. That has bothered me for, for 20 years. And I just want, want to write acknowledging that, and I feel so badly about it, I am willing to return my degree. You know, those days there was a, a code of conduct. If you cheated, you were expected to turn in your degree. So this missionary said, I will mail my master's degree back to you because I stole the answers off the neighbor's paper. Well, Dr. Vaughn had power of life or death over the fella, and he, said, he wrote back and he said, uh, you know, I forgive you. God's been gracious to me. God's been forgiving and patient with me. So I want to demonstrate that same graciousness and patience with you. I forgive you. I'm not going to turn you in. You keep that degree. You don't have to return it. And then later on, Dr. Vaughn came in, and he found out in the faculty lounge the same fella had written the same letter to three other professors. <laughs> he admitted to cheating in four classes. I think these professors, if they kind of collaborated together, they might have said, send it back. <laughs> but all of them were like Dr. Paul. That, you know, they said, we forgive you, but the guy honestly had a theft problem. He never stole money, but he stole answers off of a neighbor. Then when I was at seminary, I got to know the manager of the bookstore there. He had a Baptist bookstore, uh, and his name was Bill Bastien. Uh, and he was telling me, he said, you don't know how many times we will go through and do inventory, and we will find empty Bible boxes. The boxes came in these nice Bible. I mean, you're talking $100 for a nice Bible. He said, we'd be go, going through and we would find an empty Bible box. Can you imagine anything so low as to steal a Bible on a seminary camp campus? Just can't imagine. And he said at least twice or three times a year, he would get anonymous letters in the mail. And these anonymous letters would have $100 bills in them or, or big wads of $20 bills. And, and there would be these uh, uh, apologetic letters. Bill, I'm so sorry. I stole this Bible. I feel badly about it. I want to make amends with you. But you know, it's not just found out in the workplace. It is found everywhere. As I said, it is only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that there's any difference between us and those who are incarcerated at the Haywood County Jail. Uh, the only difference is that Jesus Christ has forgiven us. You know, it's not as though we have a different personality than they do. Not as though we're tempted differently than they are. We just have had our sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, but oftentimes there's not a lot of difference between their ethical practices and our ethical practices. Let me share some statistics about theft. Uh, every year, employee dishonesty costs the American economy $200 billion a year. Billion with a B. Shoplifting adds 20% to the cost of everything we buy. If it wasn't for all sticky fingers at Walmart, we'd be paying $8 a pound for bacon instead of $10 a pound. One third of all businesses fail because of theft. Not because they've got a bad product, not because you know, people are not interested, but because of theft, of uh, employee dishonesty. According to the Internal Revenue Service, tax fraud cost the U.S. government $180 billion dollars a year. And the IRS could reduce everybody's tax bill by $1,100 a year if it weren't for tax fraud. Now, it's fine to avoid taxes, but it's not fine to evade taxes. You know the difference. You know, do everything you can to avoid them. Nothing wrong with that, but when you try to evade them, you are guilty of violating the Eighth Commandment. Now, the Eighth Commandment is crystal clear. Thou shalt not steal. 
Again, is there anything unclear about that? Anything that needs further explanation? You're sitting there thinking, no, it doesn't need to be explained. Let's have a prayer. Let's go home. You don't need to preach a 30-minute sermon over a four-word <coughs> statement. It's very, very clear and concise. And it is true in every culture. They're not a culture on the face of the earth where theft is not frowned upon. And again, let me repeat myself, that is one of the evidences for the existence of God. The moral argument. God has woven within his creation a certain moral code. Everywhere throughout the world, killing is wrong, theft is wrong, adultery is wrong, lying is wrong. Everybody understands that there are certain things that are just off limits. That missionary stole answers and he's probably not the only one. Might be some of us in this room who've stolen some answers. Probably some folks I graduated from high school with have permanent cricks in their neck from looking over trying to borrow answers. Heard about a head football coach one time who called in a couple of his prize recruits. He said, fellas, I hate to break the news to you, but one of you is off the team. They were shocked and they protested. Oh, coach, what happened? What happened? He said, well, you know that English test that y'all took the other day? I said, oh, yeah, we remember it. He said, well, Fred, you wrote in response to one of the questions, I don't know. Jim, you remember that very same question. You wrote this answer. I don't either. So it may be answers you've stolen, it may be possessions, it may be people's reputations. How many times do we begin a conversation by saying, oh, bless his heart, and then we lower the boom? Somehow we've convinced ourselves if we preface it by saying, oh, bless his heart, then we can just say anything we want to. We can just slice and dice and decimate people all we want to if we do it under the guise of genuine Christian concern. Uh, I've heard prayer concerns that way. Oh, pray for old brother so-and-so. He came home drunk again the other night. And, you know, what you ought to say is pray for brother so-and-so, period. You do not have to elaborate and destroy somebody's reputation, but there are people who just thrive on that. You know, they go out every single day with one intention, and that is to create as much chaos as they possibly can and destroy as many lives and reputations as they possibly can. Anybody here got an extra $15,000 they want to spend? You got an extra $15,000, there is a company in Los Angeles. And for, for that fee, they will recover your reputation. That's the name of the company. Recover your reputation. Somebody trash, trashes you on social media. Somebody talks about you all over town. They will swoop in. They will talk you up. And they will rescue you. And you'll look like the greatest thing since sliced bread for the modest fee of $15,000. Now, I guess a better way to handle that is, number one, live above reproach, or number two, recognize that it's just part and parcel of the Christian life. A lot of people justify their theft. They say, oh, they'll never miss it. It is so small. When I was in high school, I worked at TJ Maxx in, in Memphis, and, and, and I was in loss prevention, which meant I had to walk around and act like I was shopping and, you know, kind of eyeball people I thought who were shoplifters. And we caught quite a few, and every last one of them would say, well, you'll never miss it. Yeah, you know, it's just one pair of hose. You'll never miss it. Yeah, you know, just one little uh, uh, necklace. You'll never miss it. You're a multi-million dollar company. You got all this insurance. It is a victimless crime. Just let me go, and I promise that I will never do it again. You know, they just didn't want to face up to the fact that theft is a sin. Okay, let's talk about this negatively 
and then positively. Now, negatively, what does it prohibit? What is it a commandment against? It is obviously against theft. Thou shalt not steal. Now, you might think this only applies to hardened criminals. You know, criminals get charged, they get incarcerated, hopefully they learn their lessons and they will never steal again. But unfortunately, it does happen in church life. In fact, I, I, I've been hesitating all afternoon. But I, I guess I'll just go ahead and tell you, you know, for 40 years, my mantra has been, trust the Lord and tell the people. You know, no church has ever fired a pastor for lack of information. So I'm just going to tell you, we were wrong this morning. You know, I, I, again, I don't know how to say it. I just want to put it out there. Apparently it was a pretty significant theft. We don't know. Maybe several thousands of dollars. Uh, we don't know what the money was done with, how people used it. Uh, it happened as the service was concluding. Uh, and, and I guess the saddest thing about it is we are convinced that it was an inside job. That, that top of the corner members are the ones who carried this out. And, and, and I, I just don't know any other way to tell you that to just lay it out there. I know maybe deacons, I probably should have not thrown this on you, but, but we, we were wrong. Uh, just, that's the only way I can, can put it. Now before you have a stroke, Remember Malachi 3 8. Well, a man robbed God. How, how have you robbed me, you ask? In your tithes and in your offerings. So that's how we were robbed. Well, really, we were robbed. It was God who was robbed. <laughs> when we don't give to the work of the Lord, then we are robbing God, and even more than that, we're depriving ourselves of the blessing. We're, we're stealing from God, but we're cutting our nose off to spite our faces. Uh, I, I don't know about you, I need God's blessings, and I try to give as generously as I possibly can, uh, because I, I don't want God to withhold anything. Now, you don't give to, because God needs it. He owns the foul of the uh, cattle on a thousand hills. You give yeah, because you need it. And you do not want to be guilty of theft, stealing from God. Uh, what are some ways we might steal from God? What does God uh, expect us to give? Number one, He expects us to give our, our tithe, obviously. When you don't tithe, you're robbing God. He expects us to give our time. You know, the Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. Things are getting worse and worse and worse, and we've got to use our time in a constructive, positive way. And, and, and I'm not sure these people who sit in their bathrobes all day in their mother's basements playing on the internet all day, social media, I don't, I'm not sure that's a real good way of uh, investing your time. We're to give our talents. You don't use your talent for the glory of God. You're withholding. You're stealing from Him. Remember the... Uh, Parable, Jesus told the parable of the talents. He gave a certain amount to three different servants, ten, five, and one. Uh, the one to whom he gave ten doubled it. The one to whom he gave five doubled it. The one to whom he gave one buried it. I played it safe. You know, I said, oh, man, I, I didn't lose it. I didn't lose it. I didn't risk it all on the stock market. I didn't blow it all in Las Vegas. No, I just didn't do anything. It's sad. And Jesus condemned that because he was not doing what he'd been created and empowered to do. And, and then, you know, we're to use our testimony and give our testimonies to God. To withhold is a form of theft. So that's what the commandment prohibits. It prohibits stealing. But then let's say it positively. positively. What does it absolutely demand? It demands total <coughs> honesty. I think there are three forms of honesty that are mentioned in Scripture. One is honesty with others. A lot of examples I could cite, but, but think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. 
He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Y'all know that song. Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, the most hated man in town. Uh, he was a Jew who worked for the Romans, was allowed to use any means fair or foul to squeeze money out of people. He could steal people's children, could steal their livelihoods, their possessions, you name it. Well, Jesus came along. He was short of stature, climbed up in the sycamore tree. Jesus knew he was there, stopped and confronted him. And uh, then there was a great banquet given. Zacchaeus came to faith in Christ. Remember the first thing he did? He said, uh, if I have stolen, I'm going to give back four times what I have stolen. Now, the word if there can also be translated sins. Man, he just don't know. Oh, yeah, I've stolen from these people, and I'm going to pay them back fourfold. He was honest with other people. And these other people may not have even known it. Hey, don't you know they were shocked when old uh, Zacchaeus showed up and said, guess what, I got saved. Uh, and, and I've uh, been holding back, and here's what I've stolen from you times four. Don't you imagine there were a few shocked recipients. That's honesty with other people. So this is the one place where we ought to be able to be honest. Now, now there's a difference between honesty and and just unbridled bluntness. I guess one reason we weren't overly crazy about our time in Dallas, people in Texas are blunt. They're almost blunt to the point of being cruel. Now, I tell you, I'll say one thing for them. They, they didn't talk behind my back. <laughs> they didn't hold anything back. You didn't have any of these secret meetings out on the parking lot. Yeah, they walked through and said, that's the worst sermon I've ever heard. Yeah, you might say that, but you're too nice to say it to me uh, here in church. Might say it the next morning, but I mean, they were just blunt to the point of being cruel. And that's not how I was raised. Yeah, I want to be honest, but I want to tone it down a little bit. So, you know, don't be cruel, but be honest with each other. How many times do we come to church, somebody says, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. And praise God. God is on his throne. And, and you know that's really not the truth. What would it be like if you walked into Sunday school next week and your Sunday school teacher said, uh, folks, I've I, I got to admit to you that it's been a rough week. Satan has worked on me. I, I've been tempted. I've been tried. I've been tested. I almost just didn't even get out of bed. I almost just mailed it in this morning. Now, how would you feel if your Sunday school teacher said, how would you feel if I said that? It's to, you know, uh, had Elvin get up and read a, a letter next Sunday, well, I, I just couldn't make the church. I, I, Satan has worked on me so bad, and I feel so um, unable or unable to stand up and preach the word of God, I'm not even going to show up today. How would you feel about that? You know, it, uh, it probably would, uh, would uh, take you back a little bit. But I'll admit, not not really here, but there have been times in my ministry I've gotten up to preach when I probably shouldn't have. I really wasn't in a spiritual frame of mind to have gotten up there and preached. Maybe you feel the way about teaching Sunday school, singing in the choir, or, or whatever. You know, so be honest with each other and just share your burdens. You do not have to be super Christian all the time. You can acknowledge your hurts and your needs and your concerns. So there's honesty with others. What about honesty with ourselves? Sometimes the most believable lies are the lies we tell ourselves. And, and, and you know what the Nazis always told people? You tell a lie often enough that people start believing it. Well, they started in 1933. Jews are subhuman. Jews are subhuman. And by uh, 1939, everybody believed that. Lie after lie after lie, it became the truth. <clears throat> You know, you keep telling yourself and you keep believing uh, this about you. Oh, I'm not worthy of uh, forgiveness. God can't use me. I've got a permanent stain. Or on the other hand, you say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm oblivious. Uh, I'm impervious. That's the word I'm meant to say. I'm impervious to sin. I've conquered that. Uh, uh, I am bulletproof and eight feet tall and Satan has no control over me. Uh, 1 John 1 8 says if we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves and the truth 
is not in us. Guys, you just need to be honest with yourself and say, uh, you know, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm not what I thought I was, good and bad. I'm not near as bad as Satan tells me I am, but I'm not near as good as I tell myself I am, and I'm certainly not as good as everybody else tells me uh, I am. You know, if somebody comes along and tries to flatter you, flattery is fine to sniff, just don't swallow it. Uh, so be honest with, with others and honest with yourself, but finally be honest with, with God. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were these, these wealthy early believers, and they came in Acts chapter 5 and made this big production. Oh, we have sold a piece of land, and we're just going to give all the proceeds to the church and and, oh, surely you ought to name this wing of the new building after us. Surely you ought to have Sapphire uh, Hall. And you ought to have the Ananias Memorial <coughs> Prayer Chapel. Surely we deserve some recognition. God struck them dead. Because they were being dishonest, you know, with themselves, with others, but, you know, primarily with God. If they had just come in and said, folks, we've made some money. We want to give some of it to the church. God would have honored that. But they came in and made a big production of how they had, had made all this money and they were giving every penny over to God. And they were immediately stricken dead. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that anymore? Aren't you glad uh, you know, people's pants don't literally catch on fire when they tell a story? <laughs> Aren't you glad that God doesn't deal with us immediately and harshly like other occasions where he has done something. Now, let me tell you the basic issue in, in theft and stealing. It's, it's a lack of trust. You trust God, you're not going to have to steal. You really believe that God is going to provide for everything you need, not everything you want. A lot of things I want I don't have, but listen, there's not anything I need that I am deprived of. People who steal are denying the word of God. The word of God that says, My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. All my needs. Again, that's not uncertain at all. That is the God's honest truth. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. Uh, and I can testify to this. When we were in, we were in Memphis, I made $311 a week. I don't know why I can remember that. And Donna was a stay-at-home mom. The kids were, were young. We had just bought our first house. And we got this unexpected bill. And I mean, it was massive. <laughs> it was probably $300. But at the time, it might have been, might have been, might as well have been $300 million. It was massive. We had no way on earth to pay. So we had a couple of options. that We could go and max out credit cards. We were tempted to do that, or I could go down to the credit union and borrow the, the money from the bank. So we kind of weighed our options and never once prayed about it. Well, I decided we'd go down to the credit union, I'd borrow the money and you know, pay it back $2 a week as long as I live. Well, I, I, I just swung by the, the post office. Uh, we had a post office box, and I checked our box, and... Guess what I had? I had a letter from some attorney in Millington I'd, I'd never heard of. And to make a long story short, my grandfather had died about a month before that. My grandfather, whom I didn't think had two nickels to run, rub together, but my grandfather had left $1,000 to every one of the grandkids. So I got there, there was a $1,000 check. Again, that might as well have been $100,000. I, I tell you, we just hit our knees and gave God the glory. The Bible says he knows our needs even before we know it. Same time we were thinking about maxing out our visa card, the postman was dropping a check in our box. And every one of us can tell a tale like that. Again, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. So you be content that God is going to provide. You don't have to steal. You don't have to beg. You don't have to borrow. You just rest uh, easy uh, on the pillow of God's arms and say, God, I trust you. You're going to meet my needs no matter what I am.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the fellowship with your people. We're thankful for the principles of your word. We know that every one of your words is, is God-breathed and totally without error and relevant for every situation in life. And I pray that we would take these truths and let them transform us, uh, help us to apply these, and use them for your glory as we move out from here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all.